everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Role Models. Today, I have the great pleasure of welcoming special guest Beth Shaw. Beth is a creative visionary and a leader in the health and wellness industry. She's an educator. She's a best-selling author of four books, a philanthropist, an animal advocate, and the founder of YogaFit, which is the world's largest yoga school. Through her work, Beth has influenced transformation and empowered thousands of teachers, students, and yoga enthusiasts around the world. Welcome, Beth. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy that you're here now. I was so excited to hear about your story because you were really a front runner. You revolutionized the fitness industry by bringing yoga into the mainstream over 20 years ago. Can you tell us how you got into yoga and what inspired you to launch Yoga Fit? Well, I actually started doing guided meditation and imagery when I was six years old. I suffered from horrible migraine headaches. And I grew up in a family that where they were not too concerned with what was going on with me. Let's just say that. So I taught myself, I consider it spiritual intervention, to be honest with you. I taught myself how to do guided meditation at age six. And I, I really cured myself of the migraine headaches. I was doing yoga as a child, although I didn't really know what it was at the time. I've been working out in health clubs since age 15 and really developed a love of fitness at an early age. And then in college, I was in a very bad car accident and I got introduced to some chiropractors who were former basketball players and they turned me on to food combining. So I started studying nutrition and everything just kind of came together for me to take this path in life. Amazing, amazing. To a lot of people, yoga has become much trendier now than when it was 20 something years ago. So how did you first learn about it? And of course, the meditation and that practice may have led you into it. But at what point did you say, wow, this is a great modality and it's something that I want to be very serious in? I really got into formal yoga when I moved to Los Angeles from New York City after college. And my first teacher was 93 years old. She used to sit on a desk and instruct. And she had a great story. Her name was Renee Taylor, and she had developed cancer in the late 1960s, went to Rishikesh, India, where Yoga Fit, my school, actually takes people every year now on uh, pilgrimages and trips. And she went to Rishikesh. She started studying yoga, meditation, Ayurveda cured herself of cancer, came back to the U.S. and started writing books and teaching. So she was my first teacher. I got lucky in that respect. And there were not a lot of teacher trainings. And remember, this is way back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. There were not a lot of teacher trainings. You had to usually go in residence for upwards of a month. I went to take one, but I, I wasn't really left with tools that would help me teach in the health club environment. So the name Yoga Fit came to me one day on a bike ride. I made sure I trademarked it early. And I came up with a style that really seemed to work for people who were going into the gym, who wanted a workout, who didn't want to lay around on the cold floor, listening to the weights clanking outside the room. And Yoga Fit was born. I started to do a cable TV show at the time. And one of my students was an investment guy. He liked the brand, he liked the logo, and he helped me raise money. We incorporated in 1997. And we've been doing yoga teacher trainings ever since. We've also expanded a lot since then. We do a lot of corporate wellness programs, retreats, consumer education. And we've got over 125 different educational programs at Yoga Fit. And we're known as the gold standard for yoga in the industry. That is absolutely amazing. Now, in terms of having Yoga Fit be part of gyms, is this a particular thing that any gym like th that anybody would go to could necessarily see or ask about? Or are there is it mostly that there are teachers there that had been trained through Yoga Fit? Can you tell us a little um, bit about the organization? It's a combination. It depends on where you live in the world. Uh, if you go into a Good Life Fitness in Canada, you'll probably take a Yoga Fit sweat class or Yoga Fit core. And we do a lot of trainings in gyms, but chances are because we have trained at Yoga Fit over 250,000 people worldwide since our inception, chances are your instructor may be trained by Yoga Fit. 
what would you consider the differences in the way that you train or the way that you have developed your program versus others? Well, I can't speak to others, but I can speak to our program. We have 65 master trainers who are experts all in their different field of study. We have doctors on our team. We have psychologists. We have exercise science people, Ayurvedic specialists, people from the military. So we've got a very talented team of master trainers. All of our trainings are done live. We don't like pre-record stuff, put it up and, and sell it like that. Our trainings are done virtually live or in-person live. Pre-pandemic, we were running 15 conferences a year across North America and about a thousand weekend trainings worldwide. Wow, wow. And again, where everything we do is based on exercise science and we really care at Yoga Fit to make sure that whether you're taking a training just for your own back pain or core health or whatever route you choose with us, we're very diligent in giving good information and our teaching method is quite unique. That's really fascinating. I love your own personal story as well as those that you've come into contact that have inspired you to put forth Yoga Fit and to help to spread this idea of wellness. Because I think that a lot of people these days are concerned about the westernization of wellness, the capitalism of wellness. And it seems like you're really taking it to a place where it's about healing. It's about an integrative approach to holistic well-being. Can you talk a little bit about your philosophy on well-being and how people can incorporate it into their lives from an individual perspective? Well, I like to look at health and wellness as a wheel, and we all have different spokes on that wheel. Obviously, yoga is one of those spokes, meditation, another exercise, proper nutrition, supplementation, positive affirmations, journaling, what we're consuming in terms of energetic intake, otherwise known as the news, social media. I think that the wheel is different for everyone, but a lot of spokes have commonalities, and that's the integrative approach, much like in the origins of yoga and Ayurveda and Vedic astrology, it was a three-part program. You know, you have to understand your Ayurvedic body type because someone who is a kapha body type in Ayurveda is never going to be a size two, and that's okay. They can be their best selves. In my book, Yoga Lean, it is based on the three doshas, the three different Ayurvedic body types. And we really go into depth in how, depending upon your body type, you can eat, you can exercise, and you can live in a way that's going to create the most balance and just make you feel good every day. And that's really the goal. It's just, you know, obviously there are a lot of clinical measurements that people need to be aware of, such as body mass index and what their fat to muscle ratio is. But we just want people to feel good, feel clean, feel clear, feel healthy, and feel empowered. And I think in the society and the world that we're living in now, it's incredibly disempowering and getting more so every day. So my platform, whether it's through my radio show, Make America Healthy, or through Yoga Fit, or if I go out and work with corporate executives or teach to a corporation or present at a conference, it's just about how you can be the best version of yourself and feel good in the moment. I love that. I think that is so powerful. And to the point of your statement earlier about understanding your body type or your dosha, I found that completely life-changing when I found out that I was a combo kapha pizza. You know, I, I just was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly right. I feel not so great when I eat these kinds of foods or, you know, drink these kinds of drinks. And I feel so much better when I have heartier foods and substances that are comforting, things like that. And it's interesting because I hear so many, mostly women, but also men who feel that they're comparing themselves to other people. Oh, why can't I look like that? Why is that person on this diet and they're losing all this weight and I'm on this diet and I'm not losing any weight. And then they feel bad about themselves and they judge themselves and beating themselves up. And that gets to be such a negative cycle. I think that the awareness and the understanding to your point of saying like, let's get you to the best version of you possible is so powerful and it's liberating. Well, one of my favorite philosophers, Krishnamurti said, every time we compare, we are disappointed. <laughs> so, you know, comparing ourselves to anyone else is, it, it, it's not empowering. And 
because we, we all have different body types. We all have different life experiences that created our body minds. We all have different thought processes that may or may not be serving us. Uh, to compare ourselves to others really is an exercise in futility. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of energy that we don't need to be putting in that direction. You know, I'd like people to wake up every day and be like, how can I be my best self today? And then at night when they go to sleep, you know, just take time to acknowledge the wins. Maybe you meditated for 20 minutes. Maybe you did some type of technology or an app that was like a meditation. Maybe you exercised. Maybe you're using a wearable so you can track your steps. You know, it's just a matter of us putting more deposits in the feel good, healthy bank every day than we're doing withdrawals. And I think most people on a deep intuitive level, if they learn how to listen to their body, and again, that's what we really teach at Yoga Fit is listen to your body. Your body will tell you what it needs, which is very different than what it wants because wants are dictated by all the advertising we're seeing on television for the worst processed foods we can ever put in our bodies from magazine articles that we might read or from external sources. And if people are really trained to learn how to listen to their bodies and move from that place, that's, that's what I would like to, to be able to share with everyone is listen to your body because your body doesn't lie and listen to your body because sometimes it's just whispering. But if you don't listen to it, that whisper is going to turn into a scream. And that's where a lot of people really fall off in their health is they're just not listening. You also talk so much about healing through trauma. And I think this is part of it because people compare themselves. People feel that they are saddled with a background or things that have happened or occurred to them in the past that they just can't get over. And you've written a book recently called Healing Trauma with Yoga and Mind-Body Techniques. There it is. Everybody take a look. Healing Trauma with Yoga by Beth Shaw. And I would love for you to tell everybody what are some of the key points of the book and what can they expect? Well, the key points of the book is that, you know, most people have encountered or uh, experienced some type of trauma in their lives. And, you know, we've just, we're, we're coming out of two years that has been incredibly traumatic for everyone. And I believe created a lot of different PTSDs. So even if you weren't trauma, if you were one of the lucky ones who didn't have childhood trauma, didn't have adult trauma, chances are you were traumatized in the past two years. So I tell my story in the book about overcoming my childhood trauma and 13 other people share their trauma stories in the book and how they used yoga and other mind body tools to help themselves heal. And again, just feel better. And that's what it's really all about right now is how can I feel better? And I, I don't mean like go have two martinis because that's a temporary fix, but how can you feel better naturally and organically? And I give people the tools that they need to help them feel better, whether it's sound healing. We have a chapter on Ayurveda in the book, a chapter on supplements, food as mood. My favorite chapter is chapter 12 and it's called living your best life. And in that chapter, I give just 22 quick tips that people can employ every day to feel better. Now, I just came off of my headstand machine with my red light in my face for 20 minutes because that's something that I use because I have a mood disorder. I've suffered from depression my entire life. It intensifies with PMS. So whether it's standing on my head for 20 minutes a day or making sure that I do a meditation or not ingesting too much caffeine, there are things that people can do. And again, I really want people to take their own physical and mental health into their own hands. I can't stress that enough. You have to take your own health into your hands because by the time you get to a doctor or a mental health professional, you may be much further down the road than you would actually like to be. That's such great advice. And I can't wait to dive into that book. I know that there's probably so much value in it for, for myself and for anybody else that might be really going through a difficult time or just want to continually improve themselves and their mood and their happiness, little steps at a time. Now you touched on nutrition. I know that nutrition has always been a very big part of your life. Can you tell us a little bit more aside from doshas and aside from eating organically, what are some of the key things that people can do do from a nourishment standpoint each and every day that could help contribute to their better wellness? 
Well, obviously eating as much fresh fruit and vegetables as possible. You know, high water content foods go a long way because our body is 70% water. Also, I gave up gluten in 2012 after I took a gluten test and I tested highly gluten intolerant. Mm -hmm. That's been a game changer for me. And the game changer for me has been more with cognitive function than anything else. So I would say avoiding gluten is an excellent strategy and just clean eating in America in particular, we're just, we're overfed, we're overfed and we're undernourished. So cutting portions down, super important. Our body takes up 85% of its energy after we eat a meal just to digest that meal. Also, we can't digest more than 25 grams of protein in any meal. So you watch someone eat, for example, an eight ounce steak, it's like throwing half of that in the trash. Mm -hmm. So in, in yoga lean, we really get into how to shrink your stomach. We get into portion control. We get a little bit into intermittent fasting. Really with food, I think for most people, less is more. Mm -hmm. I would love to probe a little bit more on the idea of fasting. I've only done a couple of fasts in my life, and I think that I had this initial concern that, oh, it might throw my body into a state of whack. Like if I deplete it for a period of time, then it's almost like binge purge. Is that a fallacy? You know, I think that most people can easily do a three-day water fast. Three days typically seems to be the magic number. I think it's a great reset so people can really get in touch with what is hunger versus what is just mindless eating. Intermittent fasting is also excellent, especially if people have 25 pounds or more to lose. Intermittent fasting really seems to work well for people. My body type, I'm Pitta Vata. So you know, I was one of the ones during the pandemic where I wasn't able to work out in the gym for a good three months. I immediately lost like eight pounds, but probably mostly muscle. So taking amino acids, if you're fasting, also works to keep protein going to your muscles without breaking the fast. I've been eating a lot of a new product I found called Energy Bits now. It's spirulina and chlorella. And it's a very high concentration of protein and vitamins and nutrients that doesn't break the keto diet. So I literally like end my day with a pack of chlorella and start my day with a pack of spirulina. Mm. I just started incorporating spirulina into my smoothies that I make in the morning time. So good. So good. And turmeric too. And we actually had the founder of that product on my show, Make America Healthy, along with a gentleman who, Lifecycle, who does mushroom formulations. Mm. That's global healing. I also take all of their products, but, uh, you know, I take like lion's mane for cognitive. I'm obsessed with cognitive function. I want my brain to work best as possible. Mm -hmm. So I, I've been taking a lot of mushroom formulations too. And actually I've been microdosing with psilocybin because I stopped taking my antidepressants in January as my, as my own silent protest against the pharmaceutical. Company. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Silent, not, not so silent because I have a radio show on <laughs> and I talk about that often, but you know, I believe also that I like to call yoga the gateway drug because I believe it opens people up to trying other health modalities whether it's plant medicine or anything else. And in my book, Yoga Lean, the third pillar of Yoga Lean, there's seven steps to being Yoga Lean, but the third one is be willing to do whatever it takes to get the results. And I think that having an open mind goes a long way in that adopting that mindset. I think that some people may get a little impatient. Sometimes they're like, oh, I've been on this for a week or I've been on this for a few days and I'm not getting results. Is there a period of time that you think is a reasonable amount of time for people to allow something to metabolize and understand about whether this is working for them or not? Well, that's an interesting question because Yogi Bhajan said it takes 40 days to create a habit. Hmm. And I am right now running a group called SOS, Sort of Sober. It's an online group for people who want to reduce their alcohol consumption. And the first seven to 10 days are all about awareness, understanding your relationship to alcohol. The second seven to 10 days is getting into your action plan. And then by the 
third part of the month, people are seeing results based upon behavioral changes and awareness. So I've run several online groups for Yoga Lean. We just had a woman who lost 70 pounds since January. What? Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. So, you know, what we're talking about are lifestyle changes and that every day contributes to long-term success. So I'm a very impatient person. I'm triple type A, I'm from New York City. Thank God for yoga and meditation. At least there's a little bit of a buffer there for me, but you know, and I'm still working on three extra pounds of stubborn belly fat that I can't seem to shake. And I think that practicing yoga is also very beneficial for anyone who's embarking on a new dietary change program because yoga gives you a lot of acceptance just to feel comfortable in the body Body that you are in. And that acceptance seems to go a long way in getting the body that you want, that's attainable and reasonable for, again, your Ayurvedic dosha, your lifestyle, and your choices. I started yoga several years ago. When I was young, I used to do a lot of dancing and I was actually a gymnast for years. And I always wanted to figure out a way to keep fit, but I couldn't necessarily keep the dance as I was getting older, the gymnastics into my daily life. And so once I found yoga, I was like, this is such a great way for me to stay flexible. And it wasn't only until maybe after a couple of years of doing that, I realized those deeper benefits, the meditative aspects and the idea of putting yourself into the fire, like, you know, moving this way and moving this way. And then simultaneously, while you look like you're standing still, there is so much inner work being done of the push and the pull and maintaining your stability, maintaining your balance, breathing, all of that. Like that's where it started to become so much more powerful than just mere exercise as it were. Yeah, inherent in the postures and the commitment to the practice comes the opportunity to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's a skill that you can bring off your mat and into any area of your life where you develop more tenacity, more self-discipline, more reserve. We are raised in a society where it's instant gratification. People don't like to be uncomfortable waiting for anything. If their phone blows up, they want it to work immediately. If they have to wait in a line or you press a button, Amazon delivers something to your door the next day, or maybe even the same day. So we almost have to retrain ourselves as humans to learn patience, to learn willpower, to learn discipline, and just to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And the more we can force feed ourselves those situations in controlled environments, like the yoga room, the more apt we are to move through life with more ease because we are not throwing our own mental roadblocks in the way. I would love to talk about you, the entrepreneur, the business person, because I think that you are such an inspiration to so many by what you've built, being a woman, having a lot of what you've called childhood issues and trauma and health issues, and being able to find a path almost like converting your pain into purpose and moving that forward in such a powerful way. Can you tell me about that journey of just being at the helm of businesses and growing some of the things that you might've learned along the way? Well, I've definitely having a business for over 24 years now, I've really grown up with it. You know, I started Yoga Fit, I was in my twenties and I have always been entrepreneurial, but learning to run a business and maintain and sustain again, I thank yoga for giving me patience and endurance and just the tools to weather the many storms that anyone who has a business, regardless of the size, and I love being around business owners because I know what they go through. There's a lot of daily challenges. Some years are better than others. There are ups, there's downs. You have to learn to trust your intuition. You will make a lot of decisions that you'll look back on and go, I wish I had done things differently. So it's kind of like this living, breathing laboratory in which one is always discovering better ways to do things, new markets, dealing with people, dealing with the customer, dealing with staff, having that responsibility. It's a lot. And I think that people who have not had that journey don't understand, which is again, why I, I presented a lot of entrepreneurs conferences on health and wellness. I love being around business owners. I always talk to people when I go into a restaurant who, who own the place 
because small business, that's the backbone of America. If you really start to think about like, unless you're frequenting big chain restaurants or hopefully not fast food restaurants, like that woman that's behind the register or running around behind the bar and directing traffic, that that's her business, that's her livelihood. And it, it breaks my heart to see what's happened to small business in the past two years in the US because a lot of them haven't made it. And the statistics are not in your favor regardless of what the external circumstances may be. So it's been a it's been a the most amazing self-growth journey for me. And then layer on, if you will, in, in the business of yoga and health and wellness. So I have to be in integrity with all of those things. Fortunately, I'm very passionate about everything regarding health and wellness. I'm always out there at a conference learning something new or or researching something. But to me, it's been an incredible legacy journey that it continues to this day. And I'm just as passionate about it, if not more so, than when I started. And I've also gained the blessing of maturity along the way, but it hasn't been easy. It's not easy. And I think that the fact that you've been able to sustain it and grow it over the past 25 years, that I mean, that is a testament to your ability to see a vision and continue weaving your path forward, maybe ebbing and flowing along the way as any business does, as anything that we're creating does. But I really commend you for stepping into something, following your heart. And I think that that's a big thing too, is following your bliss, following your passion and then that will help guide you mostly on the right path. <laughs> mostly. Mostly on the right path. And if we can get to where it's 80%, I think we're in good shape. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. That's a great point. But I want to share a quote that you said, because I think it's really an amazing quote. And you said, business without a higher purpose than profit is pointless. Can you tell us why you feel that way? Well, first of all, a lot of financial people would laugh at that statement. I'm enrolled at an education program at Harvard in the business school. I feel a little strange when I'm there because social contribution is not really a currency that you hear a lot of in business school. We have a very in-depth community service program where we require everyone who goes through their level one training, which is kind of introduction to yoga fit, everyone who goes to that training in order to get their first certificate has to do eight hours of community service work, teaching to a group of people who normally would not have the opportunity to receive it. So as an entity, YogaFit has been responsible for over 3 million hours of community service work of people teaching people who normally wouldn't have access to a yoga studio or a gym, disenfranchised populations. And you know, if I could wave a magic wand over planet Earth, one of the things obviously would be that everyone was practicing yoga and doing meditation. Another one would be that everyone would spay and neuter their animals and stop breeding dogs and cats. And then probably another one would be that we would educate everyone, especially women, on every aspect of health and wellness from a very early age, because I believe that's sorely missing in our educational system, especially among certain populations. And I believe that education is the key to everything because it gives people options. And really, I say this in yoga when I teach, the one with the most options wins. When we teach at Yoga Fit, we give several different options for all of the poses to make people feel comfortable and let them experience the pose at their level. But really when it comes to health and wellness, the more options you have, the more you're educated on what options there are, the more apt you are to make healthier choices. And that is everything from reproductive health to physical health to mental health to spiritual health, to energetic health. And we're not educating people, therefore they don't even know the options they have because you don't know what you don't know. That is so true. I myself align so well with what you've just stated because I think that we have a obligation, you know, being on planet earth, we have an obligation back to planet earth to regenerate, but also to the people from a stakeholder perspective to make sure that we're not just after their dollars. We respect them and we relate to them and that it is a cycle of community so that as much as we are receiving, if it might be energy in terms of dollars or what have you, that we are also giving with the other hand. 
And so making sure that our companies can be built on people and planet and then, you know, tertiarily profits, of course, in order to be sustainable and, and to grow, you know, we can't really rely on the government or nonprofits to be the centers of good because we know that they just can't do it all themselves. And so it is up to businesses to step in and rewrite the economic model to really place much more emphasis on purpose and mission. Yeah. I mean, again, unfortunately, our society is just based on profit and we see the toll that that takes on so many different levels, starting with a supposed healthcare system that really makes its money on having sick, unhealthy people. There's not a lot of money to be made off of healthy people. Mm -hmm unless you own a gym, you know, or a healthy food company. Our society is not set up for healthy people to win, to encourage health, again, health on any level, physical, mental, sexual health, anything. We're just not set up to win. If, look, let's face it, if the government really cared about people's health, they would be educating us. But when the food companies and the pharmaceutical companies and the hospital systems are such huge profit centers, all you have to do is follow the money and you see that it's not following you down the road to health. And I felt similarly, it's not just the health industry, as you know, it's also with respect to the beauty industry that I had been part of, a lot of dollars were made on making people feel ugly or that they had flaws, they had physical flaws and that they needed to address by buying their products, which didn't necessarily address the flaws or the underlying feelings of well-being. So yeah. true. That's mm -hmm. so true. And that, you know, you see people who do a lot of physical alterations or, you know, whatever, but that's not addressing the root. And the root is that we don't make people feel good about themselves in our society. And you know, you were in a whole industry that, that specialized in that. Yeah. Yeah. So cheers to us who are the change makers, who are yeah. you know really doing our part to lift people up, to let them know their glory, to let them know how beautiful and majestic that they are, irregardless of what the media says or what other brands may say, because this is really true wellness is letting everybody know that they are perfect the way that they are. They're there's always this opportunity for a journey of improvement and of getting to that place where you'd like to be. But if you feel good where you are, if you're satisfied in your happiness and in your place, but are eager for more, more development, more learning, more experiences, more understanding, more knowledge, more wisdom, then that's the best place to be, I think. It's the best place to be. And again, just doing something like having a daily yoga practice or going to the gym. Those are things that will make you feel good about you and just enable you to be your best self. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that beautiful picture that you have behind you. For those who are just listening, there is this incredible piece of art behind Beth right now, and it's an Indian painting, I believe. Can you tell us a little bit about what is pictured there? Yeah, that is an Indian deity. We've got the elephants there to represent protection mm -hmm. and goodwill. We have four hands, two of which are holding flowers. One palm is receiving and the other hand is giving. You see the coins coming out of the giving hand and the, the left palm, which is the feminine side of our bodies, is receiving and open. Yeah, I actually really love the Hindu religion and their philosophies and Vedanta and all of the deities. It's We take people to India every year and it's, it's very sacred and I believe you know, it's this ancient wisdom that we can all take a piece of. And there's not just one God, but there are a bunch of different deities that each represent different parts of our path, whether it's Lakshmi, the goddess of prosperity, or Ganesh, the deity of protection. There's there's something for everyone and something that you can invoke at any time. Yes, yes. The picture reminds me, it, it feels like abundance to me because there are these coins and there's the, the cycle of giving and receiving. I, I think it's just so beautiful. Now I hear, I think you've got a four-legged friend with you and I you do, do have a This is around the time he, he hijacks me. And <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> And he knows uh, that I'm on a Zoom that's and, he's reminding and he will get a bone. Uh, <laughs> and he's got me, I've had him now in July, it's 10 years. I adopted him when he was 16 months old. I got him from Labradoodle Rescue. They're on Facebook. It's called iDog. 
we're together almost a decade. And after that decade, he's got me very well trained. <laughs> I basically, I should be wearing a shirt instead of Be Grace, which is my new clothing line, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, Love it. Should all be in a state of grace. I should have a shirt that says Bentley's bitch. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel, but it, it's it's a win-win for everybody. <laughs> I think that's an idea for a clothing line for sure. Whoever's <laughs> I've, I've got a Ziggy Smalls here, and I think I'm probably Ziggy Smalls's bitch. <laughs> he's my little he's my little Chihuahua rescue, but he's a little badass. I love Chihuahuas. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Beth, it has been so amazing to have you with us today on Role Models. Everybody, I want you to learn as much as you can about Beth and what she's going on. You can find out more at BethShaw.com. You can also learn about YogaFit at YogaFit.com. She has lots of wisdom. Tune into her radio show, buy her clothes, <laughs> buy her books. Yeah, please tune into my radio show, Make America Healthy on Voice America. If you miss the show live, you can also find it anywhere that podcasts live. Perfect. Beth, thank you so much for being our guest today. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste.